Everybody knows that Star Wars is in decline. Most people know that Kathleen Kennedy is the architect behind it. Now we're finding out that Leslie Headland may have had a huge part in the fatal blow that destroyed everything Jon Favreau was working on and that getting rid of Gina Carano truly may have been the linchpin that even alienated people like Pedro Pascal. Hello folks, welcome back to the Pro Channel. It is a joy as always to have you here with us as we continue our endeavoring in explaining entertainment and keeping you ahead of the culture curve. Today we are doing so with a tremendous panel, X-Wing, Lauren Connor, and Lorena Creole. Welcome to all of you. Let's get straight into our article for today. This comes from The Hollywood Reporter. Many of you have noticed this uh, major piece that they've done on Gina Carano. It's called Gina Carano on getting sacked from Star Wars and her grudge match with Disney by Seth Abramovich. But there is a paragraph of particular import that we will discuss here because it reveals something that I'm not sure we knew before. And I'm going to read this, then I'm going to hand it over to the panel, folks. This is big time stuff. It says, well, never mind, pros on the wrong one. Here we go. It says, prior to this incident, and it's talking about when Gina Carano came under massive fire from what was allegedly an online mob angry at her about pronouns and such. Which, by the way, folks, we did a video last week on this. Turns out, according to Master of the TDS, a.k.a. Gothic Therapy, he has discovered that a huge percentage of those folks who were outraged, well, they were bots. And we wonder who bought and paid for the bots. Uh... We even discovered that at least one of those bots had the command prompt, the programming accidentally put into the message. So we, we basically know about what, what was going on there. But here's the article. Prior to this incident, Pascal, Pedro that is, who has a trans sister. Folks, we don't know if that means that uh, Pedro has a biological male sibling presenting as female or the opposite. Not sure which way that goes. Language is tricky, eh? Had laid out the basics of the trans movement for Carano. He was telling me, just put hashtag trans rights in your feed. Do it and they'll leave you alone. Carano didn't take his advice because she said, that's not my style to put hashtag anything, she explains. I'm also not going to put hashtag Trump's rights. The two had a subsequent conversation amid the backlash. Me and Pedro were close, so close, she says. He knows 1000% I'm not phobic or an ist, etc. He texted me after Carl Weathers passed away. We had our conversation and it was beautiful. One thing he did say was, this is important folks, pay attention to this. Pay attention to the familial statement here. Thank you. You and Carl Weathers have always been protectors. And he knows what that means. And I know what that means. And I wish I could tell why. We basically left it at, I can't wait to give you a big hug. Panel, These th this is a very familial way of talking with another person. These are very uh, close-knit kinds of uh, remarks. And what this brings me now to believe for the very first time is that perhaps Gina Carano and Pedro Pascal and Carl Weathers and maybe everybody else involved in all of this stuff, maybe John Favreau, that they got along really well and that this was a very close, tight-knit group producing Star Wars content that was fantastic. And somebody, somewhere, stepped into this and destroyed that camaraderie. Now, I don't like everything that Pedro Pascal has ever posted on social media. I'm not here to defend all that. But I am here to say that if Gina Carano and Pedro Pascal are still close, then it stands to reason and by the way, we know that Carl Weathers was close with them both. It stands to reason that Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm, and definitely Leslie Headland, because we know now that Leslie Headland was financially involved, according to the lawsuit, in trying to damage Gina Carano. It seems to me that Kathleen Kennedy, Leslie Headland, and whoever else is part of their little kerfuffle group, that they stepped into this and destroyed something beautiful. And now I'm left wondering. Did Pedro Pascal, did John Favreau, who all checked out after this and just said, you know what, we got to make stuff, we're under contract, screw it, we'll do what we got to do and we're out. That's that's what this feels like to me now. X-Wing, I want to start with you. 
Is that your assessment having uh, looked at this? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's kind of tough. Honestly, we, we love to speculate and we look at these articles and the articles are coming from secondhand from somebody else who was actually there. And so we don't really have the concrete about what happened. What I do know is that, you know, I've got a friend who's close with Gina, obviously. Um, and I hear a lot of different stories about Gina, um, at conventions, whatever the case may be, when it's actually out in the public eye. And all I hear is that Gina is an absolutely wonderful human being. Um, not just her fans that, you know, her interactions with her fans, but also with her co-stars. So when it comes to the, uh, you know, to these cons, the, the co-stars still run up and give her a, a huge hug as soon as they possibly can. So I think more than anything, what we what we are seeing in a lack of interaction, maybe in the public eye, may be more of a a knife to the throat, as you would say, from a from a studio perspective, uh, and less an assassination of Gina's character herself. Because yeah, like you said, I mean, apparently everybody that's interacted with this woman has absolutely loved her, and this is starting to look more like an episode, or I'm sorry, a movie like uh, Bad Bosses, where you have these three friends who just absolutely hate who they work for. Right. That seems to be more, yeah, yeah. That seems to be more of the case than anything actually wrong with Gina, and to have somebody who has a trans sister still, you know, say, "Hey, I I love this girl. I think she's you're awesome. a protector." That's yeah, what Pedro Pascal is saying is she's a protector. That's, I mean, that's something else. It just, it seems odd. It seems odd to me, but, you know, speculation. Lorena, speculation. Lorena when they assassinated the career of one Gina Carano, seems to me that they assassinated Star Wars. That's what this is looking like to me now, because let me tell you, if I had somebody that I had this kind of a relationship with that years later, I'm calling them after the passing of a loved one and saying, you're a protector. I want to thank you and all that. Um, I got to say, it, it would take all the wind out of my sails if I saw someone that I cared about in that way be fired and treated this way. So, Lorena, do you think that what Kathleen Kennedy and Leslie Headland allowed to happen or were participatory in, that it absolutely killed the franchise now? Can we say that more definitively? Actually, yeah, I agree. You actually can kind of, uh, you can't kind of say that. As someone who I liked watching The Mandalorian, and I'm one of those exception cases where I'll say that Gina Carano's character was not my favorite. However, Gina Carano, the person, and how she interacted with the fans online that definitely endeared me to her so that when she got unceremoniously fired by Disney, um, basically they didn't contact her. She found out on social media at the same time that, that we did. As just a casual fan, it's like, wait a minute, this does not seem right. And I would think that if one of my coworkers that I was close to had that happen, yeah, you're a professional and you try to carry on with your job, but that passion is gone. And when you don't have that, it's going to show up in your work. And I think that's that's just what happened, that people just stopped, you know, stopped caring. Like, if this can happen to Gina, it could possibly happen to me. So I would oh, definitely yeah, absolutely. agree with you. Well, yeah, Lorraine, I mean... The average person out there, are they more like Leslie Headland, the former personal assistant to uh, Weinstein, or are they more like Gina Carano? And then that tells you how you would be treated if you worked at Lucasfilm. If you're more like Leslie Headland, well, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to be around you, but you'll be treated great by uh, those who curate Star Wars. Uh, Lauren, I want to go to this, this paragraph real quick for you. Um, it talks about Gina Carano receiving $25,000 per episode. You start figuring this out. You come to figure out that for the season one and season two, on both of those, she made something like a hundred to one hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars on those seasons, and you know that might seem like a lot to some people out there. In terms of celebrity, in terms of uh, being in a Star Wars product, it's not a lot of money, and it's especially not a lot of money when you consider that Gina Carano faced such adversity due to all of this that she had to hide in place and lock her doors to her home and essentially be a prisoner there until the mobs went away. Uh, Lauren, this is not the first time, though, that we have heard that in spite of all of this, there was a closeness with, with she and Pedro Pascal. 
Can you walk us through, Lauren, your thoughts on all of this giant mess? Who And, and you, you just have to say that the person who made this mess is now, it's got to be Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me before The Mandalorian even came out was when they had, during uh, the celebration beforehand, they had this big panel with all the principals that were on the show. It was the first time that I had actually seen Gina. And it was obvious that they were all really excited about doing this show. Um, Gina talked at that time about how they had, they had made this character with her in mind and how excited she was for everybody to see it. And everybody was very tight knit from Pedro to, to Carl, to Gina, uh, to everybody else. Even when they brought in Bill Burr, remember Bill Burr during his comedic career had made fun of star Wars fans quite a bit, but they offered him the part because Favreau was a fan and a friend of his. And, and he came in and he did it. He was very professional. And when Gina was let go, he was one of the few that came out. And while he didn't trash Disney, he did say, you know, this sucks. This sucks because Gina was a sweetheart and everybody loved her. And I have the feeling that that's how the entire cast felt. And so I think you were talking about the amount of money that she was paid. Yeah, she wasn't paid very much for season one and two. However, right before she got canned, uh, Favreau had come out and, and told her that her entire life was about to change because she was going to be part of this Rangers of the New Republic. She was going to be the principal character there. And that was going to be a springboard for even more. Uh, I am still convinced to this day that there was more to Cara Dune's character than what was revealed in the show. I think there were going to be some other familial ties that were going yes. to be important in the storyline. Um, and so I think that also goes to explaining an awful lot of what happened with you could talk about the book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan and some of that stuff, but that's kind of irrelevant. The place I want to focus is Mandalorian season three. I think you're right. This was a torpedo to the boat. And I think season three, they kind of wanted to try and wrap everything up that they had set up as quickly as they could. And I think they also wanted to bring in Bo-Katan as a much more major character to try and see, can we successfully do a handoff of the main character of this show? And I think they've learned they can't. You know, uh, I had never thought about that, Lauren. I had never considered that Bo-Katan became a substitute for Gina. Well, yep. re remember, there was a, a talk from some of the principals working on the show that they were they were hinting and saying that, well, the Mandalorian doesn't necessarily refer to a specific Mandalorian. And I think some of that may have had to do with the fact that Pedro was unavailable for a lot of the filming of the season and he was just doing voice work. But it also may have been sort of a warning shot that, look, if you're not going to play ball because you're creating issues behind the scenes, then maybe we just shuffle you out. And because of that, I still have, I, I, I do agree that I think season four is canceled. I'm still not 100% on board with the Mandalorian and Grogu. I know that there that there have to be in you're, the middle You're of saying the movie might not happen? I, I'm, I'm have struggling to see how they can make it work. If it were me and I was looking at what they got, I think you've got to cut bait. Just leave the end of season three where it is. They ended up happy on a homestead. That's all you need to do. I don't know how mm -hmm. you, you know, make a story. Everything we're hearing, Lauren, is that Dave Filoni's taking more and more control. And mm -hmm. that comes from the fact that John Favreau's season four seems to be gone. And so yeah, that leaves but, two episodes. And we already heard that Filoni was going to plus those episodes into a theatrical worthy endeavor. And that's got to be him trying to tie it into all of his Ahsoka nonsense. I'm telling you, Ahsoka, 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 you're looking at the future of what stuff is going to be for Disney. It's going to be freaking Ahsoka and and Ray if they can somehow manage to pull it off. But as soon as it tanks, I can't imagine they go much further with it. Well, we don't even get Ray until at least 2027 at this point. I mean, if it happens. If it happens. And it might be a Disney Plus exclusive movie. To hide its box office numbers. Could you imagine? Terrible. Oh, well, if, if oh, the Mandalorian no. and Grogu so was atrocious, yeah. If the Mandalorian and Grogu does come out, I'd have no doubt that it'll be either a simultaneous or barely staggered release because they're going to want to hide the box office numbers and the viewer numbers, and so that's one way that they can try and obscure that. Um, I, I think that really. Uh, this show was uh, the kibosh was put on him as soon as that announcement came out that, that Gina was no longer going to be working with him. Uh, and I, I don't think that there's really a way to recover from that. I think they're at a point where, what are you going to do with this thing? How do you think you're going to just spin it off into something else? Moff Gideon has been taken care of. Okay. You could say he's, he's busted out and he's going to return and all that, but does anybody care anymore? 
where is the where's the narrative structure of this? You've already taken Grogu away from Luke's Jedi Academy, which was where you had a potential interesting story arc. The Mandalorian has become a guest star in his own show. Bo-Katan is an interesting character and can be a foil, but she's never going to work as the lead. She's not likable enough. Correct. Yep. So I, I just don't see how you make this work. To your Here, point, Cara Dune is a, she was a she was a linchpin to another legacy character, which I think, Lauren, I don't know if this is what you were talking about. I think there might have been familial ties there with yep. uh with with leia and so to have kind of a badass cousin who's a drop trooper who's completely motivated by what the empire did would have made really compelling star wars that's exactly how i saw it is yeah. that the logical place to go here is it explains why she's such a fanatic why yeah. why she was she was so serious about being this drop trooper and not only that it also makes her the last surviving member of the royal family, so she's yeah. a princess. Yeah, this is a this is a Disney thing. It's like you could have leveraged this, and it's so be- it's so their speed too, because you get the tough girl princess, but we actually like her, and she has ties to legacy characters. That's a home run for Lucasfilm, and they friggin' grand blew slam. It. <laughs> now, okay, so they so they threw it all away, Lorena. Here's here's what I'm trying to figure out, and we got to go into speculation territory here for this one. Gina seems to have been beloved by everybody who worked with her, okay? Gina seems to have gotten herself into trouble, not of her own doing, not of her own volition. What started this was the demand that she put pronouns in her Twitter bio. Now, that's not something that's required of everybody, apparently, right? We can come up with thousands of Disney employees and actors and actresses who who don't do that, whatever their beliefs might be. It wasn't a requisite for them living and having a career, but that was required of Gina all of a sudden. And we now know because of Master of the TDS and his phenomenal work that a huge percentage of the outrage was coming from bots. So I don't know, you know, maybe that's a company out in in uh, Burma somewhere. I don't know where that's coming out of. Maybe it's out of Malaysia. Who knows? But what in the world was the need to do all of this for? Like, why did they why did they want to sabotage her and then destroy Star Wars in the process? What what was it about her that they couldn't stand? Because she doesn't toe the line. See, here's the thing about Hollywood, and unfortunately, as I lived out among them for about five years, if you do not have the right the right ideology, if you're not saying the right thing things according to them or doing the right things according to them you are held to a different standard which is why the likes of pedro pascal i do not like several things that he's actually said online i don't want to be fired however um, carl weathers bless his heart i love him to death don't agree with his politics he's allowed to say what he wanted to say but gina for some reason has to have pronouns in her bio why? Lauren, your thought on that one? I, yeah, I was just saying that I, I think they saw it as a twofer because I, I think the real reason this happened was that first, they didn't like Gina, uh, Kathleen and Leslie Headland. I think that she was specifically targeted by them, but it wasn't about Gina personally. They didn't like her, and I'm sure that, that they would be happy to get rid of her because she exposes what they are not. Uh, she is a real strong, independent woman, and they can ding, make ding, all ding. Of these they, they can make all of these these uh, uh, fact totems that they put on the screen that claim that they're that. She is the actual real world example. So they are happy to have her out of there. But the reason was not because of Gina herself. It was because of John Favreau. It was because he had produced something successful where they had not. And I still hold to the belief that he was trying to subtly move the continuity in a different direction. And the main reason for that has to do with the first episode of the second season of The Mandalorian, where uh, you have him go to that bar before he meets uh, uh, the man in the Boba Fett outfit, uh, who is not Boba Fett. (laughs) Uh, And they show the hologram of the Death Star being destroyed, but it is not the Proxus explosion that you see in the special editions. It's, it's not the, the, uh, um, it is differing. It shows up completely obliterated. So it's where were they going, Lauren? What was the plan? What was, what do you think they were doing? I think they were trying to move away from the sequels. They, they did not show any remnant of the death star that could have supposedly crashed onto this planet in the rise of, 
of Palpatine. You think you think that after they cratered the whole thing by uh, sabotaging Gina Carano and her career, that then uh, they feloniized the whole thing? Is that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's it exactly. I think that they had determined that this is the weak spot. This is the place that we could hit, and it is the thing that derails the entire plan that they had put together. Uh, I think Rangers of the New Good Republic grief. was going it's to It's like be it's like sabotaging Robert Downey Jr. because you're mad that the MCU is successful. Yeah, Good but I'm, I'm grief these people. Perfect example. I mean, essentially here, it's like that they determined that Gina Carano was the exhaust port on the Death Star. And and that this is the weak spot that we can hit that can blow up the entire thing that was going to show them up. And they couldn't have that. These these people are vindictive, awful, terrible failures, if that is true. Oh my gosh. I gentlemen. Ladies, I have enjoyed this conversation. Um, X-Wing, let me give you the final word on this before we before we uh, say goodbye to everybody. X-Wing, is there anything here that's wrong? Anything you want to add in terms of... I mean, if, if what we're saying is true here, these people are... They are franchise kamikazes. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so I, I agree with Lauren entirely. Um, just seeing what what john did before and i know there's a lot of people who who had told me as this stuff was happening don't believe john favreau he's not going to be able to do it blah 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 there's going to be issues don't trust dave filoni and at the time i had completely pushed them off because i said look they're making the only star wars that that matters right now right uh, especially after mandalorian chapter 16 where i was like it wasn't about luke coming back it was that in that moment just for a moment it felt like the world was healing i don't know what it was but it just it, felt it like it topped the, the ratings of any streaming show yeah. period it was the only it yeah. was the first time disney plus had ever done that x-wing the first yeah. time they they beat the office which was on netflix at the time and they destroyed all of that yeah so star star wars was it was back if only for a moment it was back um, and I think to to your guys' point, I, I think I don't know why, but I don't know if they felt threatened or or what the case was. But yeah, to your point, the only thing that really makes sense was to eliminate the linchpin of the continuation of that story. And Cara Dune, I believe, was the linchpin of the continuation of that story. You know, Gina Carano aside, who I I adore and I think is a very very sweet human being, by eliminating that character, you've now basically destroyed everything because if you're growing a tree one branch has to start first and then all the other branches can go off i think they basically nipped that branch and and now what you're seeing as a result of that was mandalorian season three had massive inconsistencies not only in storytelling but also in production as well you and can tone. see where it was cut and nipped and tucked and all tried to put together for this thing to make sense and i think like we had said earlier it was basically the result of them losing one of the most important important portions of the story, which was Cara Dune. So, yeah, I mean, if we're going to sit here and argue whether or not it was relevant or if we're mad about what happened to her, yes. Well, what's really <laughs> relevant is they apparently thought they could destroy the storylines. What they really did was destroyed everybody involved in it, their desire to work with them anymore, apparently. Yeah. There's one other thing that I think people may have forgotten about that ties into this as well, and that is there was going to be a spinoff Mandalorian novel. Do you guys remember that? I do vaguely. What what Cara Dune was going to be a part of that. It was after she got let go that they oh, canceled I, the novel. I do remember this. Yes, yes, I do and remember I, that. I suspect that's where the stuff involving her heritage was going to be revealed, and it was probably mm -hmm. also going to tie into Rangers of the New Republic. Could have been. Well, folks, could have, should have, would have, uh, but they, they destroyed their franchise. I mean... Uh, they could have had another MCU on Disney Plus and then in theaters, and it would have been Star Wars. And that's in spite of all the failures of the sequel trilogy, but they chose not to. No, I if you are that. looking, though, if you are looking for a channel that is the antithesis of all that because it's just pure success, video after video, Lorena Creole is doing a tremendous job of covering the Disney Parks, Universal Studios, and more. Lorena, what do you have coming up real soon on your on your channel? Well, on my channel on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern will be my Spice Lounge show. This week, we're going to be talking X-Men 97, all the drama around that show, and basically if the show is even worth watching. And we're going to be discussing the hype 
around Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which is supposed to release on Thursday for previews. And of course, I will have a live stream on Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern over at the Animal Kingdom. Going to have fun watching the Finding Nemo live show over there and also checking out some of the animal habitats. Another channel that is fantastic is X-Wing. X-Wing, what do you got coming up? Not much. I'm going to be honest okay. with you. Yeah, Star, you Wars is, uh, Star Wars is in a really bad spot. Uh, so <laughs> honestly, it's, at this point... I've I, never it, had a guest do this, folks. I have never had a guest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to subscribe if I'm if I'm not putting out anything I think is worth watching. Um, like asking but, a race car driver, when's your next race? Well... Good tell you. I'm driving We're a not Honda anymore. Accord We're right done. Now. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm getting into uh, I'm getting into 3D printing. I think we're going to do some fun prop building and stuff just to kind of fill the time until the inevitable uh, next project comes out, which is uh, got, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with. You've got you've got a lot of new projects up ahead because the last time you were uh, on the channel X Wing, you did not yet have a special addition to your family. And I have not had the opportunity yet to congratulate you. Thank you. Uh, publicly with everybody else to say, we are so happy for you and that you have a bundle of joy that will change your life forever and is already doing so. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Her. Yeah. Princess Lily. Uh, she's, she's incredible. We love her. We've already done some star Wars photo shoots with her and everything. There's a, uh, there's a lot coming. Don't worry. Jay and I are doing a book that's going to be coming out soon. It's going to be incredible. We've got the accolade coming. I'm doing a whole bunch of new projects on, on resin printing and, and stuff like that. So I'm not dead yet. I'm not <laughs> dead yet. <laughs> and Lauren, of course, is continuing to read uh, the novels by uh, Mr. Zahn and doing a fantastic job there. Lauren is also part of the genre guys. And folks, there's a new genre guy member exclusive video coming out Wednesday this week. Don't miss it. Lauren, thank you so much for being here. What's the next genre guys content you guys are going to be recording? Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to reveal it, but it's probably uh -oh. the, uh, it's if you're not talking about the one you're releasing next week, then the one after that will be involving probably the world's greatest secret agent. All right, folks. I don't know if that's James Bond or perhaps they're maybe they're going to do commentary on Get Smart. One or the other, surely. All right, mm -hmm. folks. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's Dr. Evil. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Lorne is a man of mystery, truly, and we must say goodbye. But before we do, like, share, subscribe, click it, stick it to the algorithms, hit the notification bell, drop a comment down below, and let us know your thoughts. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, so waste not yours. And folks, don't forget to share this out on your favorite social medias. We'll see you on the Pro Show at noon Eastern on Tuesday. Folks, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing. Don't be like Lucasfilm. Treat others right. Be nice. And you know what? You might as well keep having fun. Hey, everyone. I'm Wilton the Troll. And I got a really important PAS. I just feel it's important to take a moment to reflect on the current slate of Star Wars movie. I mean, we haven't had a woman take the lead on any Star Wars projects whatsoever in Star Wars yet. And that's partly because other women who are leading Star Wars, they don't want to let that happen, which totally isn't stereotypical of women. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> but here we are, with director Sharmin Abinadab Chinook or something. Anyway, she's a woman who's bringing a lot of weight to Star Wars because of her, uh, pedigree. I mean, <laughs> look at her. Her credits from Satara, Let Girls Dream, Three Bahadur, the Revenge of Baba Balam, Ladies First, A Journey of a Thousand Miles. They all have ties to Star Wars, and some of you guys are so ignorant you have had no idea that there's something somatic through all those things in Star Wars. People who haven't been properly represented and sand. Lots and lots and lots of freaking sand. They hired her because she knows how to work with sand. That's what Star Wars is today, kids. It's Sand. Planets. Some of you are dumb enough not to believe me. <laughs> and yes, it's time for a woman to lead Star Wars. I mean, saying that has totally worked in every other sphere of life. Especially politics. Come on, Hillary Clinton. You tell them that it's time for a woman to smash that patriarchy. 
Anyway, that's all I have to say, and I think it's important for you to know that. Thank you. <laughs>